Um, but I've got a, a, a few things that I wanted to do on, uh, on the Colombian exchange. Um, and mostly I'm going to be face, uh, paying attention to, to the great dying, um, the, the population loss, and for a couple of reasons. One <clears throat> is you can use the Black Death and then the population collapse in the Americas as one of the comparison things that, if you wanted to do that. Um, it crosses the 1492 barrier, um, but there are some very interesting commonalities. Um, but obviously the point of a comparison is that you look for similarities and differences. And what else goes on when they have to do a, a comparison and contrast? Is that a CCOT? It's the, just a comp, they call it, by lingo. Uh, comp is? Comp, yeah. Well, okay. CCOT is a difference. Yeah, so. But the comp essay requires reasons for similarities and reasons for Reasons for similarities and reasons for differences. So then they need to know the context. Yes. So they don't have any documents other than they would be told, compare the Black Death of 14, 1347 to 50 with the, the collapse of population, the yeah. and that, that's it. Yes. Th are they given dates so that they sort of, sometimes, sometimes. okay. All right, well, I, I'm just really impressed that what you're expecting 10th graders to do, <laughs> whether it's in, in art history or, or world history. Uh, because I think back on my, on my uh, when I was that age, and I, you know, I wasn't a serious person. <laughs> you know, I, I'm sorry to say, I just, I, I don't know if I would have made it through, <laughs> through these series of expectations. So we'll do that, and then um, <clears throat> I will we'll go back to uh, the other uh, set of documents on, on species extinction, because I think that's interesting and important. And uh, I wanted to point out one other, th one, Final thing about somebody who has a uh, um, a course plan for AP World History Tech or AP World History course that uses uh, uh, my book, and it, you can either take a look at that or not and see how somebody else actually utilizes this and puts it into the context of, of the whole thing if we have time. Okay, so um, the uh, Columbian Exchange and the uh, the Great Dying in that that comparative context, if you will. Okay, so I think, that, and there's lots of graphics you can use on, on the Columbian Exchange. Um, and I think this is probably one of the, uh, the terms that, uh, that your students are gonna have to know and understand. And we know that it is the exchange of, of, uh, of plants, animals, bacteria, ideas, peoples um, coming in the wake of the Colombian, um, what do we call it, encounter, I guess, now with the Americas and then what happens, happens afterwards. Um, <clears throat> and of course, there is a, a tremendous amount of exchange, and it, the exchange actually also goes across the Pacific. It's usually not included in our understanding of the Pacific or the Colombian exchange, but I'll mention that just a little bit um, as well. Uh, and we know that there is uh, a trans translation or a transmission of foodstuffs, and the foodstuffs go again, Europe, Eurasia, and then the Pacific as well. Uh, but the uh, <clears throat> the most, not necessarily the uh, the most significant, and I'll explain to you why. But one of the most um, gripping stories is the story of what happens to the uh, the populations of the peoples of the Americas as a result of the diseases that get. Uh, transported to, to the Americas. Um, smallpox, for the most part, is a major one. Various forms of influenza, uh, various forms of, uh, of other things that we might think of other than smallpox uh, as being diseases that uh, Europeans had uh, made some kind of deal with the, with the germs and we adjusted to them in ways that they weren't as virulent as, as they had been. Um, so those diseases um, come to the Americas in various ways. It was 1493, the second voyage of, of Columbus, that probably brought uh, smallpox and wiped out uh, the population of, um, of one of the islands in the, in the Caribbean. Um, and then the, uh, the various diseases that preceded and accompanied Cortez in uh, his conquest of the, of the Aztecs, and then uh, of Pizarro 
get into the, uh, uh, the Incas as well. So the, there's many interesting things about these, these, uh, the transmission of these diseases, and I'll get into those in a little bit more detail. Yes? Well, people ask, why didn't uh, diseases travel from the Americas to Europe? Yes. How they didn't have all, all these yes. diseases? Um, so there's two things. Actually, I was going there. So thank you for anticipating. Um, <clears throat> it's not a two-way exchange. Uh, the guy who, who did the work on this, um, uh, Alfred Crosby, who wrote the, the first edition of this came out. The, it's entitled The Columbian Exchange. And by the way, I teach in, uh, in Southern California where um, there is no majority ethnicity in our classrooms. You know, it's about 40% uh, Latino, about 40% uh, uh, Anglo, and then 20% of everybody else. Uh, my Latino students are really kind of bummed by the Columbia, calling it the Columbian Exchange. I mean, they don't like it. Um, they're trying to come up with other names for it. And I'm sorry, so if I'm offending anybody by using the term Columbian Exchange, it's the term, of, term that we have to use. Uh, Al Alfred Crosby is the one who, who came up with it. And yes, it does point out that, that it is Columbus. Um, <clears throat> but he did two things, and I, I'll get to the, uh, the surprising part of his, his uh, argument. Um, he, he argued that the most significant outcome of the Columbian Exchange was not the depopulation of the Americas, the loss of anywhere from, depending on what the number is we start with, um, anywhere from you know, 50 to 70 million people. He says the, the real significance of that uh, exchange was the new world foodstuffs that got into Europe and Eurasia and led to if you look at that uh, population chart of China that I put up, leads to a dramatic increase in the population from, of the rest of the world from the, uh, the 16th century on. And in some ways, that, that, that boom is still going on. He said about, about a billion people more lived as a result of the exchange than died from it. Um, and you can argue with that, with that argument uh, as well. Uh, but I, I, the question is, why? You know, why is it that that it seems that the peoples of the Americas to the conquistadors, to some of the, uh, the priests who accompanied them, um, it made them look like you know, Europeans were just stronger and had God on their side and these other peoples were just weaker and could easily, you just look at them wrong and they simply die, like that. Uh, Crosby did, did quite a bit of work on this and thinking about it um, in a later book uh, that was entitled Ecological Imperialism, which is a pretty interesting book in a lot of ways. And he, he addresses that specific question. Why is it that the peoples of the Americas were so susceptible to these diseases and Europeans weren't susceptible to diseases coming from the Americas? Um, and it has to do with the Neolithic Agricultural Revolution, among other things. So, and the peopling, the peopling of the Americas. Um, his argument is, that the peopling of the Americas, and the, we're, we're pushing this date back further and further, um, began during the last stages of the last uh, glacial maximum, when up here we can't see it, but uh, where the, uh, the cold temperatures took a significant amount of, of moisture out of the air and deposited it into uh, glacial caps, which lowered the uh, uh, sea level and made a land bridge between uh, over the Bering Strait, what is now the Bering Strait, from Asia to, to the Americas. Now, that, we know that some of that first population movement uh, had been dated about 15,000 years ago with, with uh, arrowheads that were found in the area of Clovis, New Mexico. So that's called the Clovis Point. Um, and that was, for a long time, thought that was the earliest of uh, peoples getting over. But now the, there's been other excavations that are pushing it back maybe to 20,000 years ago, maybe 25,000, some are even maybe suggesting 30,000 years ago. So, but the point is that all of those <clears throat> movements of people, whether they came 15,000 or 25,000 years ago into the Americas, um, these are people who are um, hunter-gatherers, they are uh, maybe not yet pastoralists, but they're hunter-gatherers, they're moving with the game, following it along. Um, and so they came over, uh, and after that, with <clears throat> when the uh, last ice age melted, the land bridge was, uh, 
closed off, and the peoples in the Americas were here uh, without uh, any contact with the rest of the world. Now, in Europe and in Asia and in the, uh, the Middle East, um, the Neolithic agricultural revolution and development of agriculture begins. And in Crosby's argument, this is, this is a really big deal because it doesn't happen to the peoples who are here, who had migrated, but it happens, it happens to the peoples in the rest of, uh, rest of Afro-Eurasia because many of the communicable diseases that we have jumped to us from animals that we had domesticated and kept in our, um, in our houses or any place else. So chicken pox come from, well, chickens, right? Small pox probably came from domesticated cattle, a form of cow pox, right? Um, and so most of these, these communicable diseases um, came as a result of the domestication and close living of humans with animals after about 9000 BC not just simply in the fertile crescent, but elsewhere as well. And then, of course, th that gives rise to, to more populous and dense populations, and so the communication of the disease becomes possible. It becomes to be a communicable disease. And for better or for worse, we have these diseased bodies. We live in these diseased pools. And I don't know all of the other um, communicable diseases. Uh, well, we've got avian flu, flu Avian flu, right, H, H5N1 that's hanging around out there from five or ten years ago. There's the um, SARS, which jumped from humans to, from uh, civet cats that were being eaten in South China. Um, you know, you got all of these, these interesting jumps of, of diseases. So what Crosby argues is that Europeans, Asians, and Africans um, after the development of agriculture, lived in a, in a disease pool that, that they had to adjust to and got pretty well uh, accustomed to, with the exception of the really virulent ones like smallpox. Um, the peoples of the Americas, none. Even in Aztec Nation when they get to huge populations? Perhaps about the only communicable disease that we know of is, is syphilis. Has that been? That's been pretty well proven. Has it? Yeah. Again, with, uh, with DNA and genetic testing been pretty well shown to be to be the case um, and I'll give you give you an example of, of another case where it was really interesting um, you know we carry along around in our bodies we, we, we think of ourselves as a human being but actually we're multi species beings we got we got all kinds got all kinds of other animals and bugs living in and on us um, and you know you roll around with your kids and dogs and oh man you got all kinds of stuff um, Crosby argues, and there is some evidence, that the peoples of the Americas, and then he uses an example from New Zealand, the Maori, um, had healthier, less germ-ridden bodies than Europeans. They did not decompose as quickly in various ways. And he, he cites one example, which is really pretty interesting. It comes from uh, 1700s of, uh, of one of the English... Uh, settler colonists in New Zealand um, shot in, in the wars against the Maori, shot a Maori with a, uh, a musket. He was a, Ma a Maori uh, king and leader with a musket ball, right? <clears throat> and it turns out that most people die from gunshot wounds and musket wounds, not from the impact, but from the, uh, the <laughs> from all of the, the, the bacteria and crap, all those infections that come with it. So he quotes this one guy as having shot the Maori and looking at him and over the course, he said, over the course of a day, the wound healed itself. Because there was, there were no, there was no bacteria in the guy's system to keep the wound open and festering and then killing him off. I, I mean, that's, I find that really interesting. So that's Crosby's argument is that <clears throat> these peoples had uh, bodies that were not accustomed to uh, any bacterial uh, influences whatsoever, had no, no experience with them, and um, that made the diseases uh, just absolutely virulent. Uh, virgin land is epidemics. Oh, there is some, some 
evidence that uh, the diets that were heavy on maize without anything else in them leads to uh, various forms of uh, pellagra and other things, but not communicative disease, not, not bacteria. Yeah. Um, so just really, really interesting. So he says that makes these peoples and the Maori as well for different reasons um, really susceptible. They don't have the bacteria in them. They don't have experience with it. And the bacteria see a completely open system that is us without any defenses and boom, it can kill them off rather quickly. So that's a fairly long uh, answer to it. Um, but the, his second book, the, uh, um, the one on the uh, ecological imperialism goes into that in quite a bit of detail. And he, he has, in there he has that story, of, he's got a long chapter on New Zealand <laughs> and the story about the, the Maori chief who's shot and he doesn't get infected. Yeah, so bad luck, you know, among other things, for having that happen. Okay, so get to some images here. Um, and we saw from the, uh, <clears throat> from the documents on the, the Black Death that, that there's some, some speculation as to how do these diseases get passed on? How does the bug get passed on? What happens? And you've got some evidence of, of a cough. And uh, smallpox, as well as Black Death, have different forms, but they are communicable because they are, they're breathed on it. Um, and these are... Let's see, these would be from probably the uh, middle of the 16th century. I don't know who is the, what, what publication this came in to, but it shows the progression and then the, the pocking of the, of, the, uh, of the body. And what happens, um, smallpox um, attacks uh, like, like plague did as well. Um, it attacks the uh, vital organs. And then the white blood cells go in and do battle with them. And the white blood cells die, and they rise to the surface. Um, and they come in pustules. And that was, that's what makes all these pustules. That's the pox. And that's all the dead white blood cells, all the pus being put onto the, onto the body. Um, the uh, rate of, uh, in populations where people have had some experience with smallpox, the death rate is 30 to 50 percent, probably higher among the, the native peoples of the Americas. But here's some um, reconstructions of, uh, <coughs> of population and what happened to peoples. Right. Um, <coughs> the native, native population of what is now Mexico, and here we've got Peru, um, after 50 years of uh, after contact, maybe three to uh, to six million, uh, then it's down to about uh, 2.6, 1.5, and then by 1620, there's only uh, 730 native peoples, 730,000 native peoples left in uh, the part of the world that we call Mexico. When in 1491, the estimated population was probably 25 million. So 25 million to 730,000. Um, in, the, in the Americas, and I mentioned this about Charles Mann, synthesized a much of the evidence, archaeological evidence, um, anywhere between 40 and 100 million people in the Americas in uh, 1491. Um, by 1600, 8 million. Um, that, is a, uh, that is a dramatic, dramatic drop. Now, the, uh, the population decline comes not simply from uh, the diseases, which are really rather dramatic, um, but also from the wars of conquest. People did die. Cortez and his dogs of war and all of the other uh, uh, tools that he had did kill people in Tenochtitlan. Uh, Pizarro did kill people in Peru. Uh, but then there's also been a considerable amount of argument about, and evidence as well, I don't have any to cite here, about what happens to a population of people, the native peoples, when they see their, their numbers dying as a result of disease and as a result of war. And uh, by the, uh, the 1500s or by 1600, there's evidence that, that the, uh, the survivors 
are choosing not to recreate children, not to have kids. They simply choose to, in effect, die out because they see no hope for the future. Yeah, it's, it's really pretty, pretty awful. But I think you can sort of see how you, you might be in that situation where there's just no hope. I mean, what's the point? Um, and so the um, reproduction rates fall through the, uh, through the bottom as well. So it's a rather, rather dramatic, dramatic decline as well. So um, let's see what we've got. What's coming up next? This, these numbers come from actual counts in Mexico from, uh, from what becomes Mexico City. And so this one is, a, it's, it's an actual census. So they, in 1548, they had records? Yeah, people? yeah. Th these are the Spanish. Yeah, the, yeah because it's, uh, the, uh, the native peoples are put into uh, uh, the encomienda and the repartimento. So they're, they actually know who's there. They're trying to manage their, their that's labor. Accurate. Yeah, that's accurate for, Me for Mexico. The, the numbers for Peru and other parts are, are estimates based on archaeological uh, evidence. But this is pretty good. And I think this one is too. So those are, uh, those are from uh, Spanish enumerations. Well, and even... Total world population. Yeah, yeah. So let me, let me think for just a half a second. So the total world population in 1400 is about 400 million. In 1800 it's about a billion. Oh no, it's about 950 million. I've got this around here somewhere. So uh, we're, we're probably around uh, 600 million or so, 650 million. I've got, got some of that information in here. So we could, uh, that, that's pretty easy to, uh, to get out and get a handle on it. So there are uh, a significant number of, of consequences of this fact for the structure of the, uh, the, rest, the rest of the Americas and the rest of the world. And we don't have time to uh, get into a lot of this, but um, this is the, the context that creates a need on the part of the, uh, the Spanish for labor to work on their, um, on their haciendas and especially in sugar in, the, uh, in Brazil. So we've got the sugar plantations going, and, and fascinating story there. But it, it creates the, uh, the need and then the, uh, the, the actuality of the enslavement of black Africans and the movement of black Africans from Africa to the Americas. The Portuguese played an incredibly important role in all of that because the Portuguese, and there's, there's documentation on this, and it's a pretty interesting story, of uh, the Portuguese along the coast of Africa, getting to the Canary Islands um, in the 14, about 1420 or so. And some of them are uninhabited, but there's some islands, Tenerife and others, that are inhabited by a people known as the Guanches. And we're getting down closer to the equator. Um, and the, uh, the, the Portuguese, followed by the Spanish, carry out a war of conquest um, against the Guanches, and ultimately, by the, uh, the 1480s, um, have pretty much destroyed the Guanches as a people. You know, one of the first documented uh, genocides that we have. Um, they burned off uh, all the, uh, the forest in one of the, uh, one of the islands to be able to uh, make way for sugar plantations. And the Portuguese were among the first to enslave Africans from the coast and put them to work on their sugar plantations in the Azores. Um, so the Portuguese already had the, the complex of sugar and slaves together before the Americas were even discovered. And so that complex that the Portuguese put together um, in the Azores was pretty easily then uh, adapted to the Americas. Now, there's a total of 8 million people uh, left in, uh, in 1600. Um, if we fast forward to 1800, and we know that, uh, that the number of black Africans who are enslaved and then transported to the U.S. by the 1840s, the whole, and Brazil and elsewhere, is something on the order of 12 million. Um, 
By 1800, Africans constitute, or Africans and their descendants, Africans um, in one way or another. Of the 21 or 22 million people in the Americas in 1800, Africans constitute the largest majority of people. You know, we don't think about that, right? We, we think about the story of uh, 1800. Well, that's, you know, the American Revolution is over. We've got a constitution. We've got uh, the colonies are getting ready to uh, head off. Let's see, uh, Jefferson is uh, president at the time. He's doing any number of things. You know, we think about the, uh, the story from the point of view of uh, colonial America, and yeah, there's native peoples there, and yes, slavery is a problem, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't think, for the Americas as a whole, the uh, largest percentage of population is uh, Africans and their descendants. And of course, that is a heritage that continues to be with us to this very day. It's constructed in different ways in different places, and uh, Cubans deal with, uh, with that fact differently than Brazilians who de deal with it differently than Americans, North Americans. But it's, it's a legacy that we all have to deal with. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Yeah. In America, they, they still assume the title African-American, but I think in South America, they don't say they're African-American no. as much. They're whatever country they I haven't been to, uh, been to Brazil, but uh, Brazil has, uh, I think, something on the order of over 30 gradations of people based on skin tone. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Cuba is just a, a marvelous array of, of people as well. Yeah, so it's not just black, white. It's not African. I mean, it, it's... But that's maintaining. That. It's weird how it's maintained that in the United States, but it's sort of dissolved other areas. Yes, different ways of, of con conceptualizing and putting ourselves together. Um, there's a couple of other... Uh, let's see how we do it. Oh, we're gonna, I'm going to um, end this up, but I want to tell one or two more stories about smallpox because I, th I think they're interesting and significant. One is a, uh, a story that comes from China in the 18th century. Uh, another documented case of genocide. Um, this comes from an emperor who reigned through most of the 18th century. His name was Qian Long, Q-I-A-N-L-O-N-G. Um, and uh, he began a series of wars that uh, created the Chinese Empire to the size it is about today. It basically doubled the size of, of the empire. And uh, one of the peoples that he went to war against were peoples known as the Dzungars out in the far west of China. Um, and uh, the Chinese, actually the Manchu state and their Chinese uh, warriors, um, knew about the deadly effects of, of smallpox um, and decided to use smallpox uh, as a weapon of war against the, the Dzungars. And there were about a million Dzungars in, in the, uh, the 1760s. Um, by the 1770s, they're all gone. Uh, Chinese uh, sources say that about a third of them were killed by the uh, deliberate use of smallpox to kill them off. The emperor's orders were to his army to exterminate all but women and children and the uh, remainder, about a third of them, fled into what became the, uh, the Russian Empire um, and lived around the, uh, the seas of the, uh, of the Caspian Sea. So, gone, gone. Um, and uh, this is a personal uh, note on uh, smallpox. Some of you may be of my vintage, yeah. or some of you, um, were inoculated against smallpox. Um, and uh, that's a pretty good thing because uh, smallpox was eliminated from the earth uh, by actions of the United Nations World Health Organization. Um, it was pretty clear it was gone by 1975, but it was declared gone from the, uh, the earth in uh, 1978. And so, let's see, those of you who are younger don't have the, not inoculated against the smallpox? So, no, I've got I've, so those of us of a certain uh, vintage are. Well, it turns out that uh, the Chinese in the 18th century weren't the only ones to uh, weaponize and think about using smallpox as a um, biological agent in warfare. 
uh, the Soviets and the Americans did as well. So there are stocks of weaponized smallpox in the hands of both the American military um, and the, uh, the former Soviet military. Um, and it, it gets a little scarier than that. Two, three, four years ago, there was a story about um, a researcher at the U.S. Um, Institutes of Health near, near, in Maryland, near Washington, who had died. And his co-workers went into his office to clean out his office. And they found in, in drawers in his office vials full of, a, of stuff. And when they tested it, this stuff was weaponized smallpox. <laughs> you know, you think that nuclear, loose nukes are a problem. So, you know, I mean, it's not just that, but, you know, the nuclear weapons, the smallpox, the weaponized smallpox, that stuff could get loose or be used accidentally as easily as intentionally. And, you know, we're just, uh, we're just, we're just lucky. Yeah. Okay, so uh, significance. Uh, global inter uh, interactions, right, again, that's one of the major themes in uh, uh, the AP world history. Uh, the centrality of the rise and fall of the Mongol Empire. We've mentioned the labor supply problems, both in, um, as a result of the, uh, the Black Death in Europe, right, and then in, uh, in the Americas as a result of the Great Dying, but with extraordinarily differing outcomes. And this is, this is pretty interesting. Rising wages and then free labor in Europe uh, and slave black <coughs> Africans in the Americas. So when you're doing the comparison, we look at similarities and differences, and we have to explain the similarities and explain the differences. And we can do, do all of that in pretty interesting ways. Um, and I don't have time to go to climate change. <laughs> okay, very briefly, very briefly. When, the po when all those people vanished from the Americas who had been farming, forests grow back in the Americas. By 1600, vast amounts of, of both the southeast of the United States, of Mexico, and of uh, Brazil are just simply have forests all over the place again. And uh, climatologists have figured out that the regrowth of the, those forests has sequestered enough carbon to lower the temperatures of the Earth by something on the order of 3 degrees Celsius during the uh, 17th century, which gives us the 17th century global crisis that uh, a really good historian by the name of, of uh, Jeffrey Parker wrote. He, just a couple of years ago, it's an 800-page book, Global Crisis, Climate Change and uh, the Course of World History or something like that. Um, so the consequences are, are, are immense um, for both the Black Death and the uh, um, Great Dying. 